Thank you, and thank you all for coming out this evening. I see some familiar faces, which is always encouraging when you're uh, being the speaker. If anybody I can look at will smile at me if I start losing it up here or something. Um, I get to talk about one of the things, the, the thing I love best is birds. And tonight's topic is migration. And birds have this wonderful thing that as humans, I'm in, as a human I'm envious of, they have wings. And they have this ability to pick up and go at a moment's notice and change their location um, whenever they feel like it. They don't have to have a photo ID. They don't have to have a passport. They don't pack any baggage. It's a kind of a freewheeling life. They just gotta have their feathers. They gotta put on enough fat and then they can take off. So, ah, oh, there we go. So basically migration just means the act of moving from one region of the country to another. And for birds, it's a regular movement between a wintering habitat and a breeding habitat. So I handed you, just to give you an idea about a little sense of what the birds are doing around here. I handed everybody a, a, a stuffed bird. And what I wanna do is try to sort those birds into groups. To start with, we've got what I would call our resident birds. For whatever reason, these birds kind of forego long distance travel. They're the more of the stay at home types. They got themselves a breeding territory. They spend the winter here. They might make short little trips, but for the most part, they live here year round. If you have a bird that you know falls into that category, can you hold it up? Yeah, so what do we have, Mr. John? Can you do his call? Jay, 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 everybody knows that one, right? How about you? Yes, red, that's the red-headed woodpecker. It just makes a lot of noise in the mud. Mm -hmm. And this time of year, everybody says, I don't know why those woodpeckers are pecking on my chimney. It, they're not going to find any bugs in my chimney. Well, the woodpeckers, this time of year, what they're doing is trying to make as much noise as possible to stake out their territory and advertise for a date. So that's the woodpecker version of courting. And what my brother said is he's courting lead is what he's courting, particularly at five in the morning when he's pounding on his metal chimney. But anyway, year round resident, gets to be spring, wants to stake out his territory. Who else has a year round resident? You, Mr. Um, a a Andy, right? This is a year, one of our few year round resident ducks. Most of our ducks are actually, they kind of, they winter down here and then they go back up north to breeding territories up north. Now, do we have any people here who are migratory in that way? <laughs> that winter down in coastal Georgia, but then go up north where it's cooler to spend the spring and summer. We have any of those here tonight? We don't have any snowbirds in the, in the group. Um, another bird that, so that, that duck he has, the wood duck, the old timers call them the summer ducks because they stay around here in the summer. The hunters call them squealers because they go whoop, 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 and they fly away, the squealers. So uh, year round resident duck. Anybody have our, who else has Eileen? Used to be we thought that most robins migrated north to tell everybody that spring was, was, had arrived up north. But more and more now we have robins that are staying here and, and breeding in the summer. 
So they are, they are sort of shifting a little bit in, in their patterns. Um, your son's name there? Sean. Sean has a much sought after year round resident, the Eastern Bluebird. Does anybody have a house up hoping to attract bluebirds into their yard? Um, bluebirds were in trouble as a year-round resident probably 15, 20 years ago because they were losing habitat and losing nest cavities. But because of people putting up nest boxes, our bluebird population has rebounded and it's gotten really, really robust again, particularly like areas like Skidaway Island, tremendous growth in the bluebird population because on their out they have six golf courses and they have at least one bluebird box on every hole on every golf course so they were they set up a bluebird trail so our next category is birds that spend the winter here but then go north for the summer i think paul has one of those and if you happen to be dining at the Ocean Plaza anytime between about November and March or April, you might see one of these floating in the water offshore in the ocean. Does, yours, does that one talk or not? Let's see if I can get his... Um... Most people no, have heard, have at least heard this call, even if you went to watch the movie on Golden Pond years and years ago. So that's one of the birds that winters here, but then goes north. Um, I don't know your name, sir. Bill. Bill has, I call the one of our chief berry bandits. Anybody have a pyracantha a holly tree and this whole flock of birds comes in and they're wearing black masks and they proceed to eat all your berries? The cedar waxwing. They roam around, they're a winter bird. They stay later than a lot of the other migrants because they nest a little later. So there's still, there's still some around yet. They haven't all left, but they will go north for their nesting. I'm not sure, I don't know that we have anybody else. Oh, that one, very good. The beautiful hermit thrush is also, oh, isn't that a wonderful song? Thrushes may not win any beauty contests, but when it comes to singing, they're really beautiful. Listen to this. Can you hear that? Isn't that beautiful? Um, so we've had the cedar waxwing, the hermit thrush, the loon, and almost all the other ducks go north. Um, let's see, what do you have? Brown thrush. Brown? Ah, he should have been in the year-round resident category. And what's special about the brown thrasher? Our Georgia state bird. Brown thrasher is our Georgia state bird. And again, he's not going to win any beauty contests, but they are tireless singers. In the spring, they get up on top of a tree and they just sing, and they sing berry couplets. And one man who was studying them was recording them and analyzing them, and he sang like 2,000 different variations of their song. They're kind of like Johnny Mercer, you know, the bird of a thousand songs or whatever. So another year-round resident. Now the next category are the birds that spend the winter down in the, in the tropics, either Central and South America. And they migrate up here in the spring and summer because they want to come up here to nest and they eat our bugs. So who has a neotropical migratory bird? Aha! Yes, 
Ben, you've got one of the most beautiful birds. We do have them nesting right here on Tybee Island, the painted bunting. And then um, Anna, is it Anne or Anna? Anna, she's got a scarlet tanager. Now, we have another distinction here. We have birds that migrate up from the tropics that stay here to nest. And then we have birds that migrate from the tropics that just pass through and go somewhere further north. The painted bunting falls in the category of one that stays here to nest. The one that you have, a blue grosbeak, they also stay here to nest, a little bit further west, about out around Effingham, but you'll find them nesting out that area. The scarlet tanager does not stay to nest. He's a transient, a true transient. And your, um, that little black and orange one you have, the, that one is also a transient. Now what's interesting about the, the Baltimore Oriole is more of those are beginning to winter here. Instead of going all the way down to Florida and Central and South America for the winter, a lot of them are staying here now and they like to eat grape jelly and hummingbird nectar. My parents who live in Magnolia Park had six to eight Orioles all, all winter this year. They, their budget for Smucker's grape jelly was, um, was a little bit high. Oh, someone has up oh, one of those other winter birds. This wasn't a particularly good winter for the American goldfinch. Again, those are another bird that just winters here, but because it was such a mild winter up north, a lot of them stayed north and never bothered to come south. We had some, but not the usual numbers. Usually my dad spends a lot of money on Niger seed to feed his goldfinches, but this year he didn't have to feed the goldfinches very much so he could divert that part of his budget to feeding the Orioles. Um, they do have a beautiful song. I've got it, you'll hear it a little bit later in the program. And then you have another, the black and yellow one sitting next to you. That's a beautiful little hooded warbler. And they come up here and they, they migrate up and they nest in, in the bottomland hardwood, kind of wet, wet forest areas. He kind of goes, tweet, tweet, tweet you, tweet, tweet, tweet you. So, have you got, have you got it kind of, you got it, we got a group of birds that are resident, we got a group of birds that are winter residents and migrate north in the, in the summer, then we've got a group of birds that are summer residents that go south for the winter, and then we've got the transients, the ones that kind of just pass through spring and fall, and, uh, and you have to be lucky to see them. Rose-breasted grosbeaks. You'll see a picture of one later. Did anybody have the one at their feeder this year? Another beautiful transient. So, y'all ready? Rock and roll? I'm gonna get back to where my, um, my proper playlist here. All right. So I'm gonna mostly talk tonight about the neotropical migrants, the birds that winter down in the tropics and then come up here spring and summer. There has been a lot of theories about migration. They used to think that swallows went into the mud during the winter and hibernated, and then they came out again in the spring. They used to think that hummingbirds and small songbirds would migrate on the back of eagles or, or on the back of, of pelicans or some other bigger bird. So we've obviously done some studies since then to discover that by observation, by using tagging and banding, by marking, by radio tracking, by even using weather radar. You can see bird migration show up on weather radar, that there are a lot of different ways that migration has been studied now. So why, why bother? So you're a bird down in, the, in Central and South America. Why take the risk of flying all those thousands of miles just to come up here to nest for, for a couple of months and then turn around and, and, and do the return trip? What's gonna make it worth it? So 
One of the things we have up here is more food. Now, that might seem kind of strange because they have lots of food in the tropics. But what they have is a great diversity of species, but not necessarily a quantity for any given species. So come up here and you get a seasonal outbreak of some kind of insect, where all of a sudden there's tons of them and there's plenty to go out and feed your babies. Or you get, you know, a lot of, of, the, of a smaller number of species. So the quantity is better. Anybody been down to Costa Rica? You know that it sun rises at five and sets at five. You've got pretty much equal day and night. If you go, come up to North America and then go, or go all the way up to the Arctic, you've got these really long days that you can gather food and feed your young. And not as many predators. You know, like we have more snakes down here than they have up in New England. The more tropical the climate is, the more of those kind of creepy crawly, kind of snaky kind of things you get. So I'm asking the question, who migrates? We have songbirds that are migrating. We have shorebirds that are migrating. We have hawks and raptors that are migrating. We have waterfowl that are migrating. We even have some gulls and terns that are migrating. And even some wading birds that are migrating. And for a long time, the scientists have been working on a model of that birds migrate in flyways, that they have sort of normal, ordinary pathways where they, t they tend to follow. Now, the thing about birds is they have wings, and they don't necessarily read books. So it's not uncommon, although there, the, any model is only that. It's a model. The birds can, can diverge from what we expect and can and do, and that's part of what makes bird watching inter interesting and entertaining is that there's stuff that you never know what you might see. But we tend to be on the Atlantic Flyway. This is just to give you an idea of the, of the paths of some of the species. In the fall, black pole warblers go all the way from up into Canada, they go nonstop over the ocean down to the coast of South America. This is a bird about this, like this size. Hudsonian godwits, the same thing. Some of the birds have much shorter migrations. The Cape May warblers only come up from the islands all the way up the south, the southeast, and then they go back down to the islands. And then some of the birds come up and then actually take pathways out into the Midwest and into Canada. So a lot of the songbirds actually migrate at night. They are nocturnal mi migrants. So um, they take off just be like about an hour before sunset. They fly all night. They drop down and they fr frantically feed for that first couple of hours of the day. They try to get a little rest during the middle of the day. If they're really depleted in their reserves, they may stay around for a day or two. And then the, the, the next time they get a good tailwind, they're out of there. So they will wait. Birds will try to time their migrations to the wind because it's much harder to fly into a headwind. If you've ever paddled a canoe or a kayak, you know how much easier it is and how much less effort you have to expend if you're going with the current and with the tide and with the wind. So if you're gonna look for an influx of migrants to come through in your neighborhood, you wanna be watching those, those, that wind direction and watching, a lot of times the best thing is if you get a nice southerly wind and then a little bit of a storm, like a front, like we're getting this evening, would cause the birds to then drop in if it's really nice weather, they're going to keep flying. So warblers, vireos, tanagers, buntings, they all migrate at night. And then some birds migrate during the day. So if you're a hawk or a raptor and you've got a nice big wingspan 
and you can take advantage of thermal air currents, then it's to your advantage to migrate when you've got heat and you can ride those thermals up and then soar and, re and, and, and decrease the amount of energy you need for your migration. Now the swallows and the swifts, they kind of eat flying insects during the day, so they kind of do like eat on the fly. You know, they just migrate and eat as they go. And then um, cranes, storks, and geese, they are the frequent flappers. They do not have the luxury of, of soaring. They just do the flap, 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 flap. If you've ever watched a duck, a goose, or a cormorant, it's just like put on the fat and get going. So what they need, what all of us need is habitat, an area where we can find the food, water, shelter, and cover, living space that we need to survive. So, and, and migratory birds need breeding places where they can nest. They need stopover or resting places. And then they need breed, non-breeding places where they can spend the time when they're not nesting. Now, any of you travel routinely between one area of the country and another? Do any of you have your frequent stopover places? Like if you know you're going somewhere, you know there's a restaurant you always eat at, there's a hotel you really like to stay at. Have any of you gone somewhere and found your favorite place was no longer in existence? It closed since two years ago when you, the last time you were there. Well, for the birds, having some consistent habitat is really important. And that's one of the ways, one of the reasons the Georgia coast is pretty extraordinary. Because if you look at what we offer, if you're flying over the Georgia coast, you're gonna see a lot of this. And you're not gonna see like what you're gonna see on the fly, on, in the Florida coast. You're not gonna see high rise hotels or huge expanses of condominiums. All, all but three of our barrier islands um, do not have roads that get you there. So we have an incredible habitat for, my, for the migrating birds. We have whoop, back. We have salt marsh, freshwater marsh, our sandy beaches. I was just on the north end of Tybee yesterday evening and there were a lot of shorebirds out there all resting on the beach. And they're more than we usually see during the winter. And they're all getting their fancy breeding plumage. During the winter, the red knots are gray. But I saw some last night that were like all rusty red and they looked fat. And that's a good thing. Bottomland hardwood forest. We have maritime forest. Not much maritime forest left on Tybee, but Jekyll, um, Wausau, Little Tybee, St. Catharines, they've all got a great amount of maritime forest. We've got open pine forest a little bit west of us. Cypress swamp. So we want to look a little bit at who's coming to nest in this area. So how many of you feed birds in your backyard? So a lot of those birds you're feeding are your year-round birds. Some of these birds that migrate in are actually eat at feeders, and you might see them at your feeder during the summer. A lot of them are up in your trees eating your bugs. They're, they're insect eaters. So if you haven't, if these, if these are unfamiliar to you, then maybe you can start finding them in your yard. They might come to your bird bath. They might be flitting around in your oak trees. But um, this little guy is the, we need more of them. He's called the blue gray gnat catcher. We need to tell him we have an abundance of gnats. We need more gnat catchers. He has a, a very high-pitched little song. You may not be able to hear it over the... Um, How big is it? About five inches, I'd say. He looks like a junior mockingbird. 
Little, a little perky tail with white edges. Cute little guy. And they build these funny, little, these tiny little nests that they line with lichen. They're really, they put up on the branch of a tree and they line it with lichen. It's just this teeny little nest. They're really cute. Now, one of the first, one of the first migrants to get here in the spring is this little northern Perula warbler. And they go, rip, rip. I was, um, I happened to be walking in my neighborhood a couple of weeks ago and I heard some of these chip notes and I saw one of these warblers and I saw him fly over to a long clump of Spanish moss. And when he flew over to the moss, the moss started cheeping. Chip, 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 chip. And then I saw the second one fly in, also into the moss, carrying a green bug, a green caterpillar. So obviously those little Perula warblers already had that nest right there in the Spanish moss. And I talked to the guy who owned the house and I said, gee, did you know you had these, these, these birds nesting right here in your moss? And he was like, no, I'm so glad you told me. I was about to go have those trees, those limbs trimmed back because they were over my neighbor's roof. And I said, wait a week, wait a week. So these, spring is not the time to trim your trees. Now, I, I was talking with Ben about this bird the other day. They, this bird they call the swamp canary. His name is the prothonotary warbler, or the prothonotary. You'll find them in the bottomland hardwood forest. They got their name because their color is the same as what used to be a cleric's robe in the Catholic Church. There was this cleric called the prothonotary, and they wore that color robe. So that's why they gave that bird that long, strange-sounding name. Where'd you take that picture? I don't remember. Oh, Savannah National Wildlife Refuge. That one I took at Savannah National Wildlife Refuge. These are the little bandit warblers, the little common yellow throats. They're in most of the wetlands, and they go witchity, witchity, witchity. You're going to be saying, I didn't know we had all these birds around here. The hooded warbler, you see that's the one like you have the little stuffed one there. He goes, tweet, 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 yo. And last, last, um, last fall, my friend Nicole lives in Hinesville and she had a hooded warbler show up in her yard. She was putting mealworms out for some of her birds, the insect eaters. That hooded warbler stayed about six weeks and ate mealworms till it looked like a butterball. We weren't sure it'd be able to migrate because it had gotten so fat. Um, the yellow-throated warblers, they're around here. Some of them are around here all winter, but they also are one of the nesters in the Spanish moss. And then this is our largest warbler, the yellow-breasted chat. He got his name because he's very chatty. And then one of the larger migrants, it's easier to hear than to see. A yellow-billed cuckoo. And they do nest in this area. And everyone's favorite, the nonpareil, the beautiful painted bunting.
They like to nest in the wax myrtle habitat, which is why we have so many of them on the barrier islands, because we have lots of scrubby, brushy wax myrtle. Not as many on Wilmington as there used to be, because Wilmington has gotten lots of lots of subdivisions, and whenever anybody makes subdivisions, they might leave trees, but they take out all that scrubby, unsightly, tangly stuff that the buntings like to nest in. The summer tanager, he's a bright, bright red, um, no crest like a cardinal. They kind of sound like a robin with a sore throat. A tweedle dum tweedle dee. Is this a year round No, summer. summer. Summer nester. They'll, they'll, they'll um, spend the winter down in Central and South America, come up here in the summer. Yep. Yeah, isn't it beautiful? And the, the female is kind of a rusty orange, I mean, a, a, a or, yellow-orange color. Yep. And interestingly, that's, that uh, scarlet tanager, the scarlet tanager doesn't stay here to nest, but in the, in the fall, the scarlet tanager changes and turns yellow. So then he's yellow with black wings, like the female. The male summer tanager does not change. He stays red all year. Now, if you see when they're, the, the, the young males are the color of the females, kind of that orange color, if you see one that looks tie-dyed, like he's all patchy red and orange and yellow, that's the first year male get molting, getting, him, getting his plumage. Like the painted bunnings, it takes them 14 months for the young male to get, to get pretty. What? Yep. Well, it takes some, some birds are, you know, right away look like their adult male plumage. But the painted bunnings and these summer tanagers, they look like the females at first, and it takes them about a year to molt into that full adult plumage. Orchard Orioles. This is the Oriole that spends the summer here. Anybody who's got bottle brush around in their yard, they really are attracted to bottle brush. They will occasionally come to feeders for nectar and for, um, for jelly, and they have a very wiry, bouncy call. I like my orchard oriole call. <laughs> and here we have the two blues. If you get your blues straightened out, we've got the blue jay, which is our year-round resident. We've got the blue bird, which is blue with an orange chest. That's another year-round resident. We have the indigo bunting, which is all completely kind of electric blue. And then we have the blue grosbeak, which is a little bit darker blue with orange wing bars. So good chance to practice your field marks when you, when you think about your blue birds. So here's your bunting. He's a bouncy kind of. And then here's your, in, your blue gross bee. No, this is your indigo. He, can, he kind of does little couplets like, fire, fire, where, where, here, here, see it, see it. Sort of bouncy. And then the blue gross beak is a little more sing-song. I know you're all completely confused by all these calls. It's OK. Everyone's favorite, the ruby-throated hummingbird, also has a nice little call. And if you're not seeing tons of hummingbirds right now at this time of year, on Tybee, I usually see a few during migration in the spring, but I see more in the late, around from July to October is when I usually see regular hummingbird activity in my yard. So don't give up. If you, if you make sure your feeders are full and ready about mid-July. Aha, this one is easier to hear than to see. I'm sure some of you have heard this. And you thought, oh, it's a whippoorwill.
The um, whippoorwill is the cousin of this bird, but the whippoorwill migrates through here but doesn't stay to nest. This one stays to nest our chuck will's widow. Chuck will's widow. It's a night jar. They're called the night jar family. They jar the night with their calls. They're active at night. They, they open that tiny little beak and they have a gig, big gaping mouth and they eat all kinds of flying insects at night. Yay, yay. What? Does it look like a snake Not really. It's just cryptically colored because they nest right on the ground and they blend in with the leaf litter. And a similar bird, I actually saw one of these in flight on the north end of Tybee last night. It's a, um, yesterday afternoon. It's called a, a, a common nighthawk. Uh, they have a distinctive, if not very, oh, just so you know the difference in the call of a whippoorwill, here's a whippoorwill. And here's the Chuck Will's widow. And here's our Nighthawk. He's a minimalist. The great crested flycatcher, the weeper. <coughs> These birds do use nest cavities. Usually every so every every spring and summer we have somebody call Wild Birds Unlimited to say, there's something strange in my birdhouse. I don't know what it is. It's kind of bushy and it's got yellow on it. Well, these, these, um, they are cavity nesters. You can see them scouting for cavities in the spring. They'll be poking their head in every little oak, oak, oak hole. They tried nesting in the dryer vent in my neighbor's house last year. Um, bug eater. You can see there are um, lots and lots of insects, which is, unless you're putting out insects in your bird feeders, they're probably not going to come to your feeders. A couple more of the flycatchers. Again, the flycatchers don't usually win, um, they don't usually win any beauty pageants because they're kind of gray and white. There's, but, but the wood peewee is very kindly tells you what he is. He says, I'm a peewee. I'm a pee-wee, pee -wee. And then the kingbird is another minimalist. Can you even hear that at all? He sounds like an insect. They often perch near water and fly out and grab a bug and come back to their perch. Red-eyed vireo, I call him the red-eyed vireo. Vireos are another kind of um, unremarkable visually. This guy in the middle of the summer, everybody else is quiet, he'll be singing up there. He'll be going, here I am, where are you? Here I am, where are you? Here I am, where are you? I, I have an article in my book about vireos. I call it Cheerio the Vireos. So I, I don't want to expose about vireos, but I think they're, they're underappreciated. Purple martins. I actually have a nice full colony of purple martins on my dock this year. I think every, every compartment is rented. I've got six house compartments and six gourds, and I've got a, a couple in every, in every, in everything. And they, they, I love hearing them in the morning when I wake up. And then their relatives, the barn swallows. How many of you might see the barn swallows swooping around? Uh, they're all over on Tybee. Um, and they go up in this. These were nesting on top of this pipe underneath my brother's house last year, a couple of years ago. And then we have migratory raptors, insect-eating kites, the Mississippi and the swallowtail kite, 
eat a lot of dragonflies, a lot of June bugs. They do eat some little rodents and mammals and even baby birds, but their big, big thing to eat is insects. And then we have, um, in the wetlands, the purple gallinule. How many of you know what a coot is? Have you seen a, a coot or a common moorhen? They're sort of, um, well, this is their exotic tropical cousin. They only come up here to nest in the spring. Savannah National Wildlife Refuge is a good place to see them. They like ponds where there's lots of water lilies. They kind of have this whiny part of call. They're not ducks because they don't have webbed feet. They have extra long toes. The little green heron comes up and migrates in the spring, says, scow. He's sometimes called the chalk line heron because when he takes off, he leaves a line of white behind him where he, where, when, he, when he flies. And then the tiny least terns. I, they usually nest at the Publix on Wilmington Island on the roof. Anybody go shop on, not, not Whitmarsh, but Wilmington. There's the, you go into the parking lot and you hear all these little least terns swooping around and squeaking. They do nest on the beaches as well. Now, these are not exactly neotropical migrants but I put them in because they spend the winter down here on, on, in coastal Georgia. And if you notice, some of them have bands. All up and down the East Coast, they're banding American oyster catchers uh, with, a, with a protocol. So you can tell by the band where, where they were banded. So a lot of the oyster catchers that breed up in Massachusetts and Virginia and New Jersey, they know a good thing when they see it. They come down and spend the winter on coastal Georgia. There's a couple of birds that I've been seeing since 2007, every year. They're, they're coming back to Tybee every winter. And then this is um, the willet, the pier weir willet. Another bird that does breed here on, on, on coastal Georgia. But what's, what's weird about it is there's a race that breeds here, but then they leave, and there's another race that comes in for the winter. So you might think it's the same birds, but it's actually not. And this little Wilson's plover stays here to breed. And here's the list of many more that I won't bore you with. So here's a few of the passers through. Black and white warblers. Northern water thrush a black-throated blue warbler, the Cape May warbler, the boy and girl American red start, scarlet tanager, rose-breasted grosbeak. In the, in the rice fields, and even sometimes in the dunes here on Tybee, we saw a group of these down by the pond, down by Captain's Row. Um, I took that at Savannah Wildlife Refuge. Bobolinks. They actually, they were calling them rice birds. They eat the wild rice that's left out there. And then here's your whippoorwill, the cousin of the Chuck Will's widow. The Baltimore Oriole. Let's see, I think I do have, somebody asked about the Oriole call. So let me do his call for you. Oops. And then the red knot, the shorebirds, we're doing a few shorebirds that are passing through. These guys are on their way to the Arctic. They, and what's, they time their migration, believe it or not, to the mating of horseshoe crabs. Red horseshoe crab eggs are like the filling station. 
for a lot of these shorebirds. One of the things that I see when I go out on Tybee sometimes is I see the horseshoe crabs swimming ashore to lay their eggs. And people are worried that they're gonna be stranded and they think they're doing a good deed by taking the crabs off the beach and taking them back to the water before they get a chance to lay their eggs. So if you see anybody picking up horseshoe crabs, let them know that those horseshoe crabs are doing what they're supposed to do. The, the one in the front is usually bigger and that's the female and she lays the eggs and that's the male behind her. And he, he waits for her to lay the eggs and then he fertilizes them. And you'll sometimes see three or four males all competing for the privilege of fertilizing the eggs. So horseshoe crab eggs are it, there's been a real decline in the red knot population because they started harvesting horseshoe crabs in the Delaware Bay. They were harvesting them for medical reasons. They were harvesting them. The Japanese were using them in some kind of, in like the sushi, sushi trade. They've now made some legislation to stop that, but before they did, the red knot populations plummeted because if those birds don't get enough food in Delaware, they're not gonna make it up to the Arctic and their chances of having a successful breeding season go way down. Uh, these are some of the birds that in the winter, I feel like I'm stupid telling people what they are. On the left, you'll see what a black-bellied plover looks like in the winter. So I go out and I say, yeah, see that black-bellied plover? It's that bird over there with the white belly. Breeding plumage, he matches his name. I'm actually going to Alaska for three weeks this summer and I'm hoping to see a few of these guys in their fancy dress. Little semi-palmated and piping plovers. There were, there were probably 200 or more of those little semi-palmated plovers sitting around on the beach on Tybee yesterday evening. Just, they all sit up in the high ground and they try to look like a bump in the sand. Their, their back is kind of good for camouflaging. Um, if you can handle one story here, last year in, in around April or May, no, it was actually September. September, I found a piping plover on the beach here on Tybee that was wearing a lot of hardware. It had a lot of bands on, on both legs. And I went on a website because for whatever reason, there's a small population of piping plovers that nest, nest um, on the shores up in the Great Lakes. It's the smallest population. And they have a, at University of Wisconsin, they have a, they ban them, they study them and they ban them. And so I, I submitted the data and I sent a picture up to Wisconsin to their website and they emailed me back and said, that that particular bird, a merlin, a hawk, had taken its mother. They had taken the eggs and incubated them and raised them in the laboratory, raised the chick on, you know, in captivity, banded it and released it in Wisconsin. And it made it, they were so excited to find that it had made it down to Tybee by September. I don't know. But this one had already been on Facebook. They'd already put him on Facebook when they abandoned him. These are really fat little things with long bills called wimbrels. And if you look around in the salt marsh right now, you may see them out there eating fiddler crabs. Their beaks are perfectly, um, perfectly designed for eating crabs in the marsh. And then these are godwits marbled godwits with their long two-toned upturned bill. And if you look to the left of the godwit, you see that kind of small whitish bird? That's a red knot in the winter. That gray bird, that white bird, that's a red knot. Yeah, right. And then these are sanderlings and they get all rusty in the, in the, in, for their breeding plumage. In the winter, they're more white and sand colored. Another bird that was named by someone who must have been drunk. If you can see any purple in this bird, you know, you probably are using rose-tinted glasses. But he's a kind of a, a celebrity. 
A group of them migrate down here every winter, maybe 15. We saw 15 on the north end of the Tybee this year. They're kind of a little, little, little sought after celebrity on the rocks. The ones with the black bellies there are Dunlins. And then our, okay, the bird with the longest bill in this picture, the short bill dowager. Duh, because there is another dowager has a slightly longer bill, the long bill dowager. And then we have two flavors of yellow legs, greater and lesser. Around the ponds right now, the little spotted sandpipers, they have a, they fly with a little stutter in their wing beats. They stutter beat, stutter fly, stutter fly. I saw some of those around the pond on the north end of Tybee just yesterday. His relative, the solitary sandpiper, and then all these ones that people call peeps. You have to really study your shorebirds to know what your peeps. We also have a few migratory raptors, peregrine falcons, broad-winged hawks, and then migratory wading birds. So, I think we've made it to the end. Are you all overwhelmed? Look at those babies. One of them is a purple martin on the left. That's a um, seam in the gourd. And the other one is a little baby brown thrasher. A couple of the people I work with at Wild Birds Unlimited um, help do rehab and help take care of orphan baby birds in the spring. A thankless job. Well, Jonathan's helping out in the kitchen tonight, so I just want to, again, thank Diana for being here. Very informative, very colorful lecture, so <laughs> thank you so much. So, again, thank you so thank much. You. And thank you all, ladies and gentlemen, for being here this evening. I just want to remind you all that on the third Thursday of every month, we do host these Coastal Ecology Lectures here. So we hope to see you again next month. So have a good evening now.